And um, this Wednesday, uh, some of us were up at the Golden State Baptist graduation, and um, Kirk Beard walked across the platform. And I was thinking about 24 years ago or whatever it was when I got a hold of some of our young people at Hiles Anderson, and I said, we're ready to help start another church. Uh, we need a preacher. Is anybody there that thinks like us? I was asking our students, who thinks like us? Who is wanting to start a church? We didn't want to get somebody to help them start a church to not be fundamental. And um, if we're going to finance and, and um, provide the needs to get a church started, we want it to be like us. And um, so I asked among our students, and they mentioned Kirk Beard. And so we flew Kirk and April out, and, and they spent a few days with us here, and then we took them to Hemet and drove around with them, and it was summertime in Hemet. It's hot here in the summer. It's hotter in Hemet. Um, and uh, drove around, and they, they decided they would give it a shot. And um, that's where you were this morning. The beautiful facilities. Aren't those amazing? He spent, um, I'm going to say, close to 20 years renting just frustrated renting this building and renting that building and sharing a building some other church using it one hour and them using it the next hour and and uh, different churches having a different perspective on sanitation and uh, come in and the nursery's dirty and the bathrooms are dirty and then they'd clean it all and then they'd, they'd clean it for them then they'd clean it for the other. anyway long haul and then uh, he, he the lord put his heart in a and another pastor's heart to knit, an older pastor is ready to retire, and, and the pastor of beautiful facilities, uh, you could probably run 2,000, at least 1,500 in that property, wouldn't you think? I mean, it's big, beautiful buildings. And the church was down to 30 or 40 or whatever, very just dwindling away, and Brother Beard had hundreds, but nowhere to meet. And so they put the thing together, and that was difficult. Don't think that was easy. Uh, merging two congregations is not an easy thing. And uh, there's no two congregations that are alike, and everybody wants it to be like they are, which is not going to happen. There's just no way. And, um, but anyway, I was just sitting thinking Wednesday night watching Kirk walk across the platform. It was you who helped and helped get the beards out. We, we rented an apartment. We paid for a place for the church to meet, put them on our insurance. And uh, our people went over there, knocked on doors. We brought busloads of soul winners. And um, you guys provided nurseries song leader, piano player, special music, ushers. Um, the the ministry is great. It is just great to serve God. And um, I'm saying all that because I'm looking for a pastor. Uh, not for here, but if you, if that, that'd be your problem. You want to look for a pastor, go ahead. Kick me out. You can have it. Uh, but um, we need to start another church. We, I guess we've started maybe a dozen churches, but I, I'm terrible with numbers. But We've been praying about starting another church within driving distance so that we could do that again and we've, as we've done before. And um, so if you just think, uh, you know, we, we need a, who are we going to send to be the Sunday school teacher at another church? And this month we're talking about service. Uh, you don't one day decide you're going to be a Sunday school teacher and not get trained. Not a good Sunday school teacher. And you need to get trained now so that we can say, hey, how about you and your family going? Um, the, the Carlson family, they're amazing. They drove um, to Yukaipa when we started the church there. They drove for a year and taught Sunday school and junior church for a year. And the pastor said many people were in his church only because of the Carlsons reaching their kids. And um, your, your, your life can matter and um, it just makes a difference. And, but yet yeah, you wanna get trained and uh, we're, if, we're if, if we could find, by the way, pray for our Bible colleges, not many guys are wanting to start churches, not many guys are wanting to pastor. And I don't get that. Uh, I don't get that at all. My son Josiah, when he graduated, he has a lot of weaknesses, but, but uh, ministry is not one of them. And uh, he said, Dad, I don't get it. And I, I, why do people not want to start churches? But he said, if I'm not going to be in the mission field, I'm starting a church. And he was not about to go sit somewhere. And, and uh, he wants to do something for God. And um, and, but we need that. The, the, the harvest is plenteous. <clears throat> and uh, the curse on a nation, I could show you scripturally. That we're, we're, I'm waiting for Pat McDowell to find 1 Kings 12. But uh, the curse on a nation, I don't know if I said that, so that's why I threw it out there again. 1 Kings 12, 
The curse on a nation is when God stops calling young men to preach. And when young ladies start being called to preach, that's the double curse on a nation. That means God is completely done with a nation. And we are in great, great need. And probably the biggest need uh, we will have to start the next church is can we find a young couple who are willing to step up and do the hard thing? And uh, get out and uh, and pastor and train and and uh, anyway and God um, and and my morning moments Monday Wednesday and Friday of video morning moments I'm telling many of the stories of when we started the church and and um, telling about people and circumstances and uh, the stories can't begin to tell them all but God definitely started our church and that's why we want to pray because you don't want to do something without God in it. Uh, I think God needs to birth things, and so we need God. Anyway, look with me here at 1 Kings chapter 12, and um, if, if I'm late tonight, it's because of the girls saying so long. It's not that I have an hour and a half long sermon. And by the way, tonight is just part one. This morning, was I nice this morning? It's Mother's Day. That was a Mother's Day sermon, man. You don't know, most Mother's Day, I'll preach on hell or judgment. or I was nice this morning. And um, but not tonight. Tonight's part one. So if you if you like tonight, come back next week for part two. All right. Except you you girls can't come back. Let's stand for a moment as we read the scripture. Look with me at First Kings, chapter twelve and verse twenty six. First Kings twelve and twenty six. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David, if this people, go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem. Then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they shall kill me, and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Whereupon the king took counsel. Now this is the king, the kingdom just split. Jeroboam was given the northern kingdom, and he was given in the prior chapter an unconditional promise of God. I will give you the ten tribes, and you can rule according to your own heart. Just follow me. You can do anything. I'll give you this whole nation. Just follow me. Unbelievable promise. And the southern kingdom was given to David's seed, which would be Rehoboam, would be Rehoboam Solomon's son. And this is Jeroboam thinking to himself. These people go to Jerusalem and worship and on and on. And so verse 28, Wherefore, whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And he set the one in Bethel and the other in Dan. That's the further north and the furthest south point, basically, of the nation of the northern half, the kingdom. In verse 30, and this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one even unto Dan. And he made a house of high places and made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month and the fifteenth day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah. And he offered upon the altar, so did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made. And let's pray. Father, help us tonight. I'd ask for your help for our church. And we're just frail human flesh, all of us but we would sure like to keep doing what we've been doing. Uh, we need the protection of heaven, and we need the direction of heaven, and, um, and we need you, Lord, to keep us on track that we might keep doing those things which you have ordained us to do, that we might be a help to others. And we think of the young people on deputation right now that sat in our Sunday schools, those young people that went to our camps and conferences and others already on the mission field or in the ministry. And Lord, we need that 10 years from now and five years from now. And so we pray, help us. And help us, the men and the ladies that are going to be here. This is their home. May we keep the ship straight and help us in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. I don't know. Uh, let me just give you a, a quick test here. How many of you have an Apple phone? All right, how many of you got an Android phone? All right, we're about 50-50. Do you know that Androids and Apples are different? 
You know, you know how you know they're different? They're different. If they were all the same, they'd all be called apple. But there's one superior and there's one inferior. No. Um, how about this? Um, how many drive a Ford? Hardly anybody. How many drive a Chevy or a GM product? How many drive a, one of the loser products? I mean, <laughs> uh, Brother Dan, how many drive a fire truck? <laughs> um, you know, when you, when you change something's name, you do it for a reason. Let me just, this has nothing to do with the sermon. Keep your Bible open here. But this is a, this is a pet peeve. Do you know why you girls change your name when you get married? Because you are changing. You have given yourself to this man to be one flesh. And Hillary Rodham Clinton didn't do that. She kept her identity. She wasn't ready just to be Bill's wife, which no woman should and most men wouldn't. I was going to have you raise your hand if you're a man, but I was worried. Do you know men and women are different? They have different names. Got from the Garden of Eden. They're different. And we have names. And out in the front of this building, it says Faith Baptist. But it doesn't just say Faith Baptist. It's Faith Baptist Church. And when I write out my check, I know that is incredibly old-fashioned, and some of you young people don't know what a check is. But I still write checks to church. That's about the only thing in the IRS. But uh, when I write out my check, I could write Faith Baptist, but you know what? I put church there. Because we're not a twig, a vine, a fellowship, we're a church. Because in the New Testament, Jesus wrote, or Jesus had the apostles write to the church that's in Corinth and the church that's in Ephesus and the church that's in Galatia. And in the Revelation, the first two chapters, he wrote seven letters to seven churches. Because if they take the name church off, they change the name because it's different. And a lot of, I remember years ago when people started pulling Baptists off their church name, it irritated me. And then after a while I thought, I shouldn't be irritated, they're being honest. They're not Baptists. They should take the Baptist name off and quit being a fraud. And there is a difference. And I want you to look with me tonight, and I've got a lot of territory to cover, but um, it, when I, I got saved, three days later left for a secular college in Washington, um, some months later, I was introduced through some friends to uh, North Valley Baptist Church in Reading, where Pastor Blue was, and, and um, just during the holiday, we were there, and then, I, so I spent a year and a half in college, and, and I just knew God wanted me in the ministry, and Pastor Blue had a small Bible institute, and that's where I started college, and I went from there to Howells Anderson, spent, uh, I managed to spend seven years getting my four-year degree, and uh, it's all right, long as you get, get what you need to get, that's the most important thing. And, um, and I came out and started our church, and, and be very honest, we called this a Baptist church because I'd been at North Valley Baptist, and I'd been at First Baptist in Hammond, and, and uh, it took a long time for me to study enough to realize I'm a Baptist. I'm a Baptist by conviction. I am a, if Jesus were here today, he'd be a member of a Baptist church because there's no way you can be what the New Testament church was and not be a Baptist. You just can't. I'm not saying other people aren't saved. I'm not saying they're not good people. I'm just saying I'm a Baptist. And, uh, and, and if you're something else, it's not a problem. I don't mind that. Um, I'm not going to be. Somebody said, what would you be if you weren't a Baptist? I'd be embarrassed. Ashamed. I don't know what else. But um, I went to, uh, I got saved on a Wednesday night, left for college on Saturday. And all, I had this hardback Bible, the kind they call pew Bibles. And uh, the church had them in the, I don't know why they had them. You ought to have your own Bible. You ought to bring a Bible to church, by the way, not your phone. And, uh, but whatever, you know, do what you want. But I think you ought to have a Bible. Nobody ever walked over to someone looking at their phone or their tablet saying, are you reading the Bible? This, this is a testimony. 
When I walked out of the house tonight to come to church, I had a tie on. I'm going to church. And I was carrying my Bible. I'm going to church. And, and I want my neighbors to know where I'm going, what I'm doing. And uh, I don't show anything off. I just, I'm not going to the bar. I'm not going to the nightclub. I'm not going to the casino. I'm going to church. And uh, you ought to have a, I think you ought to have a Bible. But anyway, so I get to college on Saturday. And Saturday, I picked up that, uh, that Bible that was given to me the night I got saved. And I read, actually Saturday night, I was in a motel halfway to college, and I read the, the Gideon Bible in the drawer. And then on Sunday, I was at college, and I began reading that Bible. And that first year, I guess, I probably read that Bible two hours a day, maybe three hours a day. Um, I just immersed myself in it. I just, I had found what I wanted. I'd been out in the world, not evil. I'd not done a lot of wrong things, as the world would call wrong. But I knew this, I found what I longed for. And, uh, and I, I didn't study, I was on a basketball scholarship. You don't study for ceramics. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but I, uh, I read that book and I read it and read it. And I didn't even, I figured out from my own Bible reading I should get baptized, I figured out from my own Bible reading. I remember, I, I, I just figured out, you're not supposed to go to parties, you're not supposed to drink liquor, rock and roll music's wrong. I figured all those things out reading my Bible. Because if you immerse yourself, what happens, and especially, I'm, I'm, I know I've got a lot of young people here home from college, and, and I knew Daniel and, and Scotty were coming, and, and, uh, but I, I knew I'd have young men and young ladies here. But you know what happened? As you flood yourself with the Word of God, you're building a divine filter. And that filter, a divine filter pulls out or filters out the trash and only lets through what's pure. I didn't hear one sermon on liquor, and I knew liquor was wrong. I didn't hear one sermon on rock music, and I gave it rock music. And, and I was home at a break, and someone gave me a, some of you that are old, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to bring up any names of groups, so you'll be humming their songs, but what would be late 70s Christian rock? And they gave me an 8-track. Some of you remember, what, some young people, what's an 8-track? Uh, but anyway, I had an 8-track player in my car, and, I, and I'm listening to that driving 700 miles back to college, and I thought, this is what I got saved from. I decided rock music was wrong before I ever heard a sermon. You know why? I had created a filter that so, I didn't have anything else. I didn't, I didn't have a lot of preaching. I didn't know you could get preaching. I went to church once a week. And, um, but, it, uh, you know, I'm, just, I'm a college kid, brand new. I didn't get any discipling. I got a Bible. And I filled myself and filled myself with the Word of God and and my, I began changing friends. I began moving away from this and moving toward that. Why? My filter told me what was right and wrong. And I sat there in, in a, a fraternity house with a bunch of the biggest heathen on the planet. They probably run the country today. And they couldn't be my friends. They just couldn't. Something happened. Poured the word of God into my life. And... I go to the Bible college there in Reading, and you had to have a, a ministry of some kind, and a young pastor was there. Um, Brother Deal, do you remember uh, the Farnworths? Is that name familiar to you? Steve, Steve Farnworth met me in the registration line, <clears throat> and he said, what are you going to do for a ministry? I've been playing basketball and reading my Bible. I don't know what a ministry was. I said, what do you mean? He said, you have to have a ministry. He probably lied to me. And he got me and my wife, who we were not married at the time, but we were dating, and, and he got us to come to his church and, uh, and help him out in this little tiny church in a little tiny nowhere. And, um, and, he's, and look, you're talking about a guy, I didn't know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John knew each other. I mean, I, I learned it during that first year reading my Bible. I, I knew nothing. I didn't know the song Amazing Grace. I knew nothing. And the year, uh, year and a half I was in, in Washington going to Bible college, or going to the secular college, I, I went to church some, but not a lot. And um, it's funny, I went to a, a Saturday night Christian college group. You know what songs I learned there? I learned Father Abraham <laughs> at a college group. I learned all the songs you sing in junior church. They were singing at the secular college. And, and I didn't know hymns. And uh, so... Steve Farnworth gets us to go out there to that little church he was pastoring. And he said, all right, Bruce, you'll be our song leader. 
So I get this hymnal, and I thumb through. Now, why? The only reason I can explain why I picked what I picked was for a year and a half I developed a divine filter. Let me read you the lyrics of the first song I led singing of in public. Oh, how well I remember in the old-fashioned days when some old-fashioned people had some old-fashioned ways. In the old-fashioned meeting as they tarried there in the old-fashioned manner, how God answered their prayers. It was an old-fashioned meeting in an old-fashioned place where some old-fashioned people had some old-fashioned grace. As an old-fashioned sinner, I began to pray, and God heard me and saved me in the old-fashioned way. There was singing, much singing in those old-fashioned airs. There was power, such power in those old-fashioned prayers. An old-fashioned conviction made the sinner pray, and the Lord heard and saved him in the old-fashioned way. Well, they say, it is better. Things have changed, don't you know? This is the first song I ever led in public. They say things are better. Things have changed, don't you know? And the people in general seem to think it is so. And they call me old-fashioned when I dare to say that I like it far better in the old-fashioned way. I led that song as I had hair down to my shoulders. <laughs> I didn't know anything. I didn't have any good preaching. I just, what I was figuring out, I had to go to the pastor and say, what about this baptism thing? He said, well, yeah, you get saved, you're supposed to get baptized. Why didn't anybody tell me? Why do I have to figure it out on my own? Verse 4. If the Lord never changes as the fashion of men, if he's always, verse 4 in the song, not in your Bible, I'm sorry. You're all looking for that verse. <laughs> if the Lord never changes as the fashion of men, if he's always the same, why, he's old-fashioned then. As an old-fashioned sinner saved through old-time grace, oh, I'm sure he will take me to an old-fashioned place. And I'm sure there were some old-fashioned Christians in that auditorium looking at me, I had pretty hair. I reckon they kind of feathered it back. <laughs> Some of you girls wish you had hair as good as I had. <laughs> Why? From the moment I started in Bible college, I was old-fashioned. Why? Because this book will give you an old-fashioned filter. I'll tell you young guys something, especially you college guys, get off your video games. Parents, you need to get rid of video in your house. If you cannot control it, get rid of it. Most of it ought to get rid of, you ought to get rid of it anyway. There are people meeting people around the world. People you don't even know. Perverts you don't even know. Uh, if you're going to have anything, any kind of, and you, you guys, you think, man, I just love video games. Stop it then. What's your favorite book of the Bible? Can you tell me what the book of Haggai talks about? Do you know anything about Nahum? Have you ever heard of Obadiah? If this book has not become a part of you, you know what you're getting? You're letting technology create a filter. You're letting the, the podcasts and you're letting YouTube create a filter. And just like this book created a filter that filtered out drugs and liquor and parties and the wrong crowd and rock music and wrong kind of, I look, I had a, I saw convictions in my heart and mind. I went to a, we went to a place, my wife and I went to the first college activity and it was at the lake and there was a houseboat and evening activity. This girl comes up with a t-shirt over a bikini and I thought, that's not right. I don't, I didn't say it, it's none of my business, but she needed more clothes on. Where did I get that? I'd never heard a sermon on modest apparel. But I'll tell you what I'd done for a year and a half. I'd flooded my mind hour after hour after hour with the Word of God. And this book gave me a filter that says modesty is appropriate for a girl. Now, you can let the world give you a filter. But something is creating your filter of what's acceptable. I don't know what it was. I was walking through a, I don't know. Costco somewhere I don't know where I was but a TV it's like an, one of these animated commercials that's we're gonna get to the Bible in a minute hang in there gotta set the stage and I'm not in a hurry um, and and like almost real cartoon kind of thing and this gal is chopping wood 
She's got her axe and her wood, and then she's carrying the wood she chopped, and she goes over, and there's a guy sitting there. The man is sitting there reading a book to the kids. That bothered me. That's creating a corrupt filter in your mind. That's making the woman the dominant factor and the guy the sedate teacher of children. And my filter rejects it. Because I live where you cut wood to heat your house. And I can tell you this, I'm not saying a woman couldn't cut wood, but I never saw it happen. Never. Not one time. Now, you might be some masculine gal sitting here tonight saying, I can cut wood. Oh, yeah, I'm sure you can. And I bet you could probably knit, too. What's knit? I don't know. Never mind. Let's look at the text tonight. Verse 26. Again, if you don't know the story, I can't take time. I'm already 15 minutes late. I should have stopped already, and I've not even started. But I don't know if I'll come back from Florida. I'm going to meet the senior class. I might just like humidity and three-inch cockroaches and alligators <laughs> in every piece of water. Someone told me every piece of water in Florida has an alligator in it. I thought, why do you, what do you, how do you live there? What a stupid place to live. I saw a picture. Somebody had an alligator in their pool. They had to call somebody to get the alligator in their pool. Get your gun, shoot it, eat it, make boots. Anyway, verse 26, Jeroboam said where? In his heart. You better start being careful when you don't get your counsel from the word of God. Jeroboam's problem is God had told him, I'm giving you the land, you're going to be fine. And in his own fearful heart, he said, oh no, oh no. Tell you what, fear and doubt will destroy you. He said in his heart, now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. God clearly told him in the prior chapter, we don't have time to go back, you read it tonight. God clearly told him, I'm giving you the northern kingdom. Ten tribes, they're yours. Verse 27, if this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, even to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Now, God had commanded every Jewish man to go to Jerusalem three times a year at the three main feasts. They went other times, but three times they had to go. All the men, remember the day of Pentecost was fully come, Acts chapter 2? Sixteen different nations were represented at Pentecost. Why? Because I don't care if you're in Zimbabwe, a Jewish man is to be at Jerusalem at Pentecost. And he said, if these people go to Jerusalem, they're going to like Rehoboam more than me, and I'm going to lose my position. You say, I don't get that. Oh, I do. That's like a preacher not preaching on alcohol. Because he's afraid if he preaches what the Bible says, he will lose his following. It's no different. This is the contemporary churches of America. If I talk about hell, though Jesus talked about hell more than he talked about heaven, if I talk about hell, I'm afraid people are going to go to the church down the street. See, that's what, that's what bothered Rehoboam, or Jeroboam in the north, Rehoboam in the south, and Jeroboam could not accept the fact that God had chosen him and made him to be the spiritual and political leader of the nation. Not spiritual in a sense, but in a sense he was. The Levites were the priests. And he was so worried about the guy down the street getting church members from his church. He said, I just, they're going to go. You know what? If people choose to obey God, it is always right. It's always right. You ought never be afraid. You young men, if you're going to go off in the ministry, you don't be afraid of preaching the truth of the word of God. And don't you be afraid of what's going to happen. And if somebody leaves because you preach the truth of the word of God, they needed to go. The last thing you want to do is build your church on people who don't want the word of God. Jeroboam's panic stricken over this. Boy, if they go do the will of God, they're going to, I'm going to lose my position. You see, I've got to remind myself on occasion, because I'm flesh like anybody, but I'm here because God put me here. And nobody can unput me here but God. Now, Jeroboam, and I could be like this, you can stupid yourself out of your position. 
You can do enough stupid things. Dr. Howells used to say, no man can destroy me. They can provoke me to self-destruct. And that's what Jeroboam did. Look at verse 27. If these people go to sacrifice, they're going to kill me. Verse 28. Whereupon the king took counsel. We don't know who he talked with there. But earlier, there's some counsel we won't talk about earlier. Just, but you young men, read the earlier part of this. Listen to the counsel of old men. You young guys, quit getting advice from young men. If you're going to be in the ministry, the last thing you need to do is get advice from other young preachers or college friends. Your college friends are dumb as dirt. Find some old preacher and get counsel from him. Verse 28, whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold. You know why he made calves of gold? Remember the last time you read about calves of gold? Exodus 32. Remember, they came out of Egypt, crossed the Red Sea, go down to, to uh, Mount Sinai. Moses is up on Mount Sinai. Joshua's there. They come down. He says, the, it's the noise of war. It was a rock concert. And the people were naked and dancing around two golden calves. See, Jeroboam had been down in Egypt. Where you hang around before you go into the ministry will set your filter. And see, Jeremo, Jeroboam had been in the world. He'd been down in Egypt. He got comfortable around the things of Egypt. What in the world was he doing down there? He's a child of God. He's a Jew. He should have been in Israel. But because he took time away from the word of God, found himself in Egypt, he started filtering a worldly filter. So when he got in trouble, he made golden calves. That's like saying, you know what? I don't know how we're going to keep people in church. So we start shortening the hymn line that's appropriate. And I just say this, you girls, you do what you want, but I can get to preach what I want too. And when you sit down, your knees ought to be covered. That's just a good rule of thumb. That's just a general thing. You say, oh, I'm not judging anybody. I'm just telling you, you got to draw a line somewhere. Every man in here will admit there is such a thing as a skirt that's too short. All right, let's just take the survey. Men, is, there, is it possible for a skirt to be so short it's inappropriate? If it is, raise your hand. If you're a, a gay guy, leave your hand down. <laughs> if girls' legs don't bother you, the next question, do guys' legs bother you? <laughs> Ouch. Verse 28, wherefore the king took counsel, two calves of gold. He'd messed his filter up. Now look at this. And he said unto them, it is too much. It's too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. And that's, and that's the pastor today saying, now you know what? We don't need to have a bunch of these standards. And, and you know, it's just those old hymns in the choir. Look, if we don't have a good guitar player and a set of drums, it's too much for you to go to the old hymns. It's too much for you to have purity. It's too much for you to have morality. It's too much to expect people to go soul winning. Forty years ago in July, maybe August, I guess it's August, I started with some of the men in our church writing our church constitution and Somebody took a copy of it home as we were writing it and showed it to a friend of theirs in another Baptist church in town. And he looked at it and he said to the guy who's in our church, he said, that guy will never build a church with these beliefs. It is too much. This is never too much. This is never too much. Obedience to the word of God is not too much it's just simple as that let's go on with the scripture look at it here by the way i've not even gotten to my notes but i've got uh, i've got next sunday night he said if this in verse uh, 28 he said it's too much for you to go up to jerusalem behold thy gods you know what he found he found a religion that was easier let's just let's just look don't go all the way to jerusalem mrs goddard and i drove around the country of israel one and a half times in an afternoon. It's not too far to go to Jerusalem from anywhere in the country. You could get there in a half hour. It's too much. It's too much. How are you going to expect to build a youth group with standards like this? Uh, because God says it. And we're going to let God build the youth group. It's too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. 
He just said, he just lied. Verse 29, he set one in Bethel and the other he put in Dan. You know what he did? He said, let's make it really easy. We'll let you worship here. We'll let you worship here. And whatever is closest, that's where you can worship. And, and you know what? That God down there going to, to uh, Jerusalem when you bring the sacrifice. Look, how about these two golden calves? They're cute. Aren't these nice? And we've got a society today that has got a comfortable religion. It's a relaxed religion. It's don't expect, look, just come on in. And you don't want to make people feel uncomfortable. I want sinners to be uncomfortable. I want people to come to church and say, wow, these people are different. If somebody who's unsaved can walk in here on a Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday night and not think, wow, this is different, then the church needs to change. We're not unsaved people. We shouldn't sing like the world, act like the world, look like the world. No, we ought to love everybody. The, the church ought to be different, folks. We, we don't look. I don't want the world to be comfortable in the house of God. We go out so, we say, how are you going to get them saved? I'm going to knock on their door. And get them saved and welcome them into the family. And by the way, when you get a new baby, they're always a little, they make everybody else awkward. I like that guy back in Indiana. We were there. He got saved. He was rough as could be. He's up, up in the balcony, and everybody's saying amen, amen. And this guy says, blankety blank, that's good. He's just cussing across the whole auditorium. Young Christians can make people uncomfortable. I'd rather have that than a guy sleeping. But try to say amen, okay? I'm good with amens. We don't need, the old-time religion was not comfortable. I think these chairs are too cushiony. I mean, beyond two inches of cushion is probably liberal. But, uh, but the young guys on staff, they pick this stuff out. I don't take the blame for this. For me, it was old, worn-out, dirty pews. Old-time religion, don't repolster the pews. Verse 30, this thing became a sin for the people. They went to worship before one, even in Dan, and he made a... Now look at verse 31. And he made a house of the high places, and he made priests of the lowest of the people, were not, which were not the sons of Levi. This guy... He started letting anybody be ordained. He started letting anybody be the, the, the priest or the, the reverend or whatever it might be. Do you understand the, what this book says about the man of God? And by the way, that term is a biblical term. Paul writes, but thou, O man of God, do these things and do these things. And a young man who wants to preach ought to know what he believes and how he ought to preach and how he ought to live and he ought to know God's hand is on him. And we've got a whole culture. How do you, how do you believe the Bible and ordain a woman? How do, you ordain, how, do you believe, how do you believe the Bible and ordain a queer? It's going on in most denominations in America. But when there's no men left, what are you going to do? Remember that, that church I was at? Uh, we just, again, I, was, I didn't know anything. I just spent a year and a half reading my Bible, and I was talking with the pastor, and he was, he was new at the church. He said, well, we got, we got two deacons. Man, one of them smokes, and neither one of them very good Christians. And I said, then why do you let them be deacons? He said, well, they're the best I got. And I, I didn't say it. It's none of my business, but I thought, you don't need deacons. If you can't have holiness, you don't need deacons. Because this book will give you a filter holiness if that tv spits out some trash and it doesn't bother you here your filter needs changed if the immoral and the indiscreet and the vulgar and the lewd don't bother you you have let the world give you a filter we got a problem in america's churches because our filters are filthy they let too much through. It's like using a fishnet to filter coffee in your coffee maker. Do you use filters in your coffee maker? We do in my Sunday school class. We are old fashioned. Dan and Kathy gave us a Keurig and we use that, but I still have a fill. I don't drink coffee. I, don't, I just pour water in, dump in a bunch of coffee. Every once in a while I ask, does that coffee taste okay? And they say, yeah, it tastes like church coffee. <laughs> I don't know what that means. One more point, 
Verse 32, Jeroboam ordained a feast in the, in the eighth month, on the 15th day of the month. Notice this phrase, like, like unto the feast that's in Judah. Hey, we're just like the, the Baptists. Well, if you're just like the Baptists, put Baptist on the name. Well, we're, you know, we're, we're a Bible church, they're a Baptist church, but we're just the same. No, you're not. You're a Calvinist. You believe people are predestined to hell. You don't believe in soul winning, and you're going to send a bunch of your people's kids to hell. You are not just like us. He's, oh, no, he, see, see, Jeroboam, he, he wanted to be as close to the real thing as he could, but not. That is the beginning of the loss of old time religion. Because old time religion says we ain't the same. Shubal Stearns and that group of guys who started the Bible Belt in the era of George Whitfield, they would not go to the revival meetings of George Whitfield and those famous preachers. They said they murdered our fathers. They'd have their own revivals. Their revivals didn't have people barking like dogs, running out of the building, hitting their heads on trees. You read the stories. I've got a whole book of strange evidences and experiences in the great revivals. And I don't doubt people got saved. Jubal Stearns was, got saved at a George Whitfield meeting. You know, we want to be very careful that we don't want to be like what's right. We want to be like. We want to be the same. We'll talk more about it next week. Let's pray. Father, help us tonight as we think of the things that you've told us in the scriptures. We don't need to twist and change and make it easy and comfortable. We ought to have a strong conviction of what's right and wrong. May we love the world around us. May we love people and love and care for those who are hurting. But may our church and our home be a place where we love holiness. May there be a love for the Bible, a love for preaching, a love for purity, and, and enough Bible in our heads that we get a biblical filter to filter out all that smut. We pray, Lord, for help that we would, uh, if we don't get the, the Bible filter put in our head and in our heart, None of the rest of it matters. We will be the shallow people conforming to something that we really are not. And so help us, we pray. May we, this week, school's out for a lot of people. I pray these summer months we would fill our hearts and minds with your book. And we'd shut off a bunch of the, the world's influence. And may we, some of us that are older, realign our filter. And the young, I pray especially these college students this summer, they would flood their souls and hearts and minds with your book. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand quietly just for a moment with our heads bowed. Have a brief invitation and we'll close.